podium and all the audio will be picked up. Okay, good. Mark will moderate. Okay. If it's there's an engaged dialogue, we'll let it go ahead for five or ten minutes. If not, we'll shut right down the podium. Okay, I'll, I'll rely on you to take care of the time. Great. Okay, I'll watch some of those 45 minutes. Oh, there's different times. I've played that role before. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Professor Mark Wera, Chair of the Theology Department and Director of the Cortex and Enduring Questions Program here at Assumption College. On behalf of, P of President Cesario, I want to welcome you to tonight's event sponsored by the President's Lecture Series. This series provides a forum for timely, and tonight's lecture is nothing but timely, and important ethical, spiritual, and human questions to be debated from within the Catholic intellectual tradition. Both as a professor of theology and the proud father of a current PC friar, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Sander Keating. An associate professor of theology at Providence College, Dr. Keating earned her STL from the Pontifical Institute for the Study of Islam in Arabic. And she took her MA and PhD in Roman Catholic theology from the School of Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America. Professor Keating is the author of Defending the People of the Truth in the Early Islamic Period. For those of you who want to buy it, you can get it on Amazon from Brill Publishers, although I warn you, it's very expensive. Her articles and essays have appeared in the Thomist, the International Journal of African Catholicism, and Jerusalem Studies in Arabic and Islam, just to mention a few. Her most recent publications include articles from the Encyclopedia of Islam and a forthcoming piece on the defense of the rationality of Christian doctrine in response to Islam in the ninth century. Dr. Keating served on the Vatican Commission for Religious Relations with Muslims and is currently a member of the USCCB Mid-Atlantic Dialogue, regularly participating in Catholic Muslim dialogue both in the United States and abroad. Professor Keating's lecture tonight is titled, as you can see, Do Muslims and Christians Worship the Same God? What have we learned from 50 years of dialogue with Muslims? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandra Keating. Well, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I have come up to Assumption College to lecture on similar topics several times in the past, and I always really enjoy the hospitality here. It's uh, nice to be able to come up here. It's a short drive from Providence, and so thank you for having me again. 
Oftentimes when I'm asked uh, to come up with a title, I oftentimes, as, uh, as you know, <laughs> wait until the last minute to come up with a title for the lecture that I'm going to give, in part um, because there's always something going on in Muslim-Christian relations. Sometimes it's very positive. Um, the Pope's visit to the United Arab Emirates, um, the recent statement made with al-Azhar uh, um, in Egypt uh, between the Vatican and, um, and al-Azhar. Um, sometimes it's very bad and negative, as we see uh, with the attacks on Christ, Christ Church in uh, New Zealand. And on the one hand, um, I can never quite predict what's going to happen. I was just asked, uh, did, uh, did I plan this? Um, you know, was this uh, lecture in response to what happened? Uh, actually, this lecture was planned quite a while ago, um, but it in some ways is not surprising to me that there's something again in the news about Muslim-Christian relations. So one of the things I want to talk about today is actually a question which people will sometimes uh, think that uh, the problem of Muslim-Christian relations is fairly recent, and in fact, uh, we find already debates going on within the Quran of what does it really mean um, to say that Muslims and Christians, do they worship the same God? In what way do they worship the same God? Um, we could add Judaism in there as well. Many of you are aware that in the Quran, Jews and Christians are also included uh, with it under the title of the people of the book. Um, that just adds another complication, so I'm not going to speak too much about the Jews tonight. But this is really an ancient question. It goes back to the seventh century. Do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? And what I'd like to do tonight is to look at both um, the reasons why one would say, yes, of course, Muslims and Christians worship the same God, as well as to raise some questions as to, or maybe uh, some suggestions as to why one might say Muslims and Christians do not worship the same God. What I also want to do is to look at um, what the Catholic Church has said about this. The subtitle here is what we've learned from 50 years of dialogue with Muslims since the Second Vatican Council, and I'll talk a little bit about Nostra Aetate. Uh, we have had uh, formal established uh, um, dialogues between Muslims and Christians. Um, as well as informal, we see lots and lots of informal dialogues that have gone on uh, for centuries, as I said, um, already beginning in the, at the end of the seventh century, uh, exchanges of letters, conversations that go on. So what I'm trying to do tonight is to summarize a very long history for you and maybe make a little bit of a sense out of it, and then hopefully to say um, how we can think about that in the modern world where we seem to uh, see both a lot of progress as well as a lot of conflict going on. We can certainly say that since the Second Vatican Council, things have changed. But what in fact has changed? On the one hand, I think we can quickly point out or point to a more positive attitude uh, towards dialogue. Of course, very quickly after Vatican II, the question came up, well, what, what is exactly the goal of dialogue? The goal of dialogue is not to come up with a, a third religion that we can all agree to, um, something that we can kind of say, well, yes, we all agree, we agree to all these things, we'll just leave all of our differences beside, aside. At the same time, um, having a dialogue uh, shouldn't just be talking, it should be about something. I think what we can see in the positive engagement um, since the Second Vatican Council has been a real desire to learn more about one another. If there's something that uh, we can say absolutely characterizes the, the, the texts and documents that have come out in the last 50 years, it's that there is a real attempt on both sides to speak about the other in a way that they can recognize themselves. We are uh, much more careful in most of the dialogues that I'm involved in. Uh, we spend most of our time tailoring our responses or our public statements so that both sides feel that they're equally represented and that, the, that um, their ideas and their teachings are accurately presented. There's a real desire not to mischaracterize each other. A real question, though, uh, might come up um, between Muslims and Christians of, well, does Islam supersede or replace Christianity? 
Can Christianity ever accept the prophethood of Muhammad or anything about the Quran? What about the Quran might Christians accept as being true? Or is the Quran something that Christians should never accept as true? Early on, and I think um, as an academic, I always like to go to the history of things um, to see, you know, what did people right away when they first encountered Christ, um, Islam, what did Christians think about Islam? Most Christians um, thought that Islam was a kind of variation of Christianity. And we see quite early on that the most common characterization of Islam was that it was a heresy. Now today, we get very nervous when we hear the word heresy. Everybody doesn't like to talk about heresy. But there's something important about characterizing Islam as a heresy that I think we can't forget. And that is that Christians saw that Islam was a lot like Christianity, but in some very important ways had deviated from Christianity. They started out with the assumption that Muslims and Christians did believe in the same God, and Christian writers thought Muslims had gotten that wrong, and Muslims thought Christians had gotten it wrong. And the debate then was about what aspects of these, um, these teachings about God were correct or incorrect. For example, does God reveal uh, God's will in a book, or does God reveal God's will in a person? Um, is there such a thing as original sin or not? What is uh, the necessity of grace? Uh, if there's no original sin, does one need grace, for example? We see people like John of Damascus, who I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, um, saying that, yes, um, Islam is just like one in a long list of heresies that we've seen before. People who, they had part of it right, but they didn't get it all right. And he engages Islam um, in somewhat of a disparaging way, but starts out again with the assumption that Muslims and Christians share some common beliefs about one God, about God as creator, about a God who um, speaks through prophets, about God who has a relationship with uh, creation, about um, a creation that has a beginning and an end, that it comes into existence because God wills it and it will go out of existence because God wills it, and that all of these things were very important. So although there were some significant differences, even people like John of Damascus, who were quite critical of, of some of the contents of the Quran, saw that there was a lot of commonality. We see that there was a difficulty in the very beginning that different Christian communities had different experiences of Islam. Some Christian communities um, uh, lived very easily side by side with Muslims and accepted Islamic rule. Um, other Christian communities really resisted and saw the coming of Islam as a, as a sign of the end of the world. We get a lot of apocalyptic literature in the, um, in the seventh and uh, early eighth centuries that the coming of Islam is a signal that the end of the world is coming. Other people have said, well, actually, um, they're not demanding too much of us. Um, there's a lot of stability that's being uh, put into place, and we can kind of live with it. And so, as a consequence, in the first few centuries of encounter between Muslims and Christians, we get both moderately accepting and somewhat positive views of Islam, as well as extremely negative views of Islam. The same thing we find on the, uh, of the experience of Muslims. In some places, we find that Muslims had very little interest in, um, in coercing or bringing uh, the Christian population into Islam, didn't really expect that people would convert to Islam. In other places where there was a lot of resistance uh, to Islamic rule, we see much, uh, much stronger statements being made about the need for people to submit to the rulers and to accept not necessarily become Muslims, but to at least accept the basic premises of the religion, all right? um, to accept the superiority of Islam. And so, as we study these early, um, these early encounters, we see a wide variety. There's a third thing that weighs into this, is um, the, the actual arguments that were going on within the Christian community in this period. It's very important, it's something that we don't think about too much, we tend to think more of Protestants and Catholics in the modern world, 
But at this period, there was a great debate going on among what we'll call the Nestorians, today the, uh, the Church of the East, um, the Jacobites, or the Miaphysites, the, um, the Syrian Orthodox Church, and the Chalcedonians, or the Melkite Church. And all three of these had they had, had their um, they, they were, had broken apart as a consequence of the ecumenical councils. Whether they accepted Chalcedon or not was the primary dividing one. And sometimes these different groups um, sided more or less with the Islamic community. Sometimes, uh, for instance, the, um, the the Nestorian Church of the East, uh, which dominated in Persia found that they um, got along very well with the Muslim rulers and formed a lot of alliances. Uh, whereas the Melkite church, which was more associated with Byzantium, they had a lot more um, uh, difficulty. Um, Byzantium was resisting uh, very much the in Islamic invasions. And so then we get um, uh, many of the early writings in which Christians and or Muslims argue about, was Muhammad a true prophet? Um, is this, does, do Muslims believe in the same God? Are also tied to questions of to what extent was Muhammad influenced, for example, by the Nestorian church? All right. The Melkites often say, well, they're heretics because they're associated with the Nestorian church. All right. And just like the Nestorians are heretics, Muslims are heretics as well. But again, I'd like to go back to this, um, this point that um, they all assume that Muslims and Christians believe in the same God, but what they don't agree on is whether that community has it right about how to think and worship and pray. Now, why should we care about this today? <coughs> well, there's a way in which it seems like Arguments be, that going on between the Syrian Orthodox Church and the Nestorians and the um, and the Islamic invasions don't really have much to uh, to do with us today, but in fact um, they have a lot to do with us today. Uh, we live in a world that has been formed and has been influenced by these deep-seated concerns about whether we're getting it right on how we organize our communities on how we worship God, on how we welcome people who have different beliefs within our communities, et cetera. And again, once again, um, we've seen, one of the reasons why I chose the title that I did, Do Muslims and Christians Worship the Same God, is because I've been asked that question more and more and more in the last 15 years as I've gone around and given lectures about Islam. Um, when I first began about 20 years ago, no one ever asked that question. And recently, more and more people have asked, you know, well, are Muslims and Christians basically the same? What do they agree on? What don't they agree on? Do they believe in the same God or not? Are they a group of people um, that we should fear as Christians? Right? Um, are they going to undermine our sense of identity? We saw um, fairly recently um, a move towards trying to emphasize um, the commonality that Muslims have with Ch Christians and Jews by the use, uh, it became really widely used, the use of the phrase, the people of the book. And for about uh, 15 or 20 years, it was very popular to refer to Muslims, Christians, Jews as the people of the book. That has kind of moved to the side a little as people of come more and more to realize that that's a particularly Quranic way of speaking about these three religions. Uh, the Quran emphasizes that each of these three religions have received a book, okay, a, a scripture or a revelation that has come from God, that the, the Jews have received the Torah, the Christians have received the Injil or the, um, the, uh, the Gospels, and Muslims then have received the Quran and that this has happened in a kind of consecutive order. The Christians especially began to resist that because the emphasis in Christianity isn't so much on a book as it is on the person. And that somehow emphasizing the book in Christianity wasn't quite right. Um, instead, what we've moved towards now is, use, is speaking of Abrahamic religions, and in particular, the claim that all the three of these religions trace some important aspect of their theology back to Abraham. 
This, in turn, has raised some more questions. Um, do Muslims, Christians, and Jews actually regard Abraham in the same way? Um, and if they don't, what difference does that make? I was just at a, a meeting about um, two weeks ago uh, in which all three papers that were presented were about how um, uh, Abraham was presented within each of these religions, and particularly whether the concept of the covenant is the same, for example, in the Torah as it is in the Quran. So this is an ongoing, very active uh, question in theology. But we can see again um, that there is a desire among people to come up with a way of speaking about the commonalities that we have. So, let me see, oh, it works, okay, good. <laughs> um, the first, uh, I wanna give you a few examples of just some texts that we can work with here in the next half hour. Um, this one comes actually fairly late uh, compared to what I've been speaking of already, but it's Pope St. Gregory VII's letter um, to An-Nazir, um, the Muslim king of Mauritania, and he, um, sent this letter in the year 1076, so this is quite a while ago. He says this, um, we and you must show in a special way to other nations an example of charity. He's talking about that uh, Muslims and Christians um, both uh, put an emphasis on caritas or on, um, on caring especially for the poor and those who um, cannot take care of themselves and cannot defend themselves. He says, uh, we, should, uh, we should show in a special way to other nations an example of this charity. For we believe and confess one God, although in different ways, and praise and worship him daily as the creator of all ages and as the ruler of this world. All right. And so here we see that Pope St. Gregory VII um, thought that there were certainly some things that even though, as he says, uh, we confess one God in different ways, that we can find some things that we hold in common. Right. The next one, which is a little more, um, is, has recently become, uh, well, not so recently anymore, um, became famous. Um, the Byzantine Emperor uh, Manuel, he himself uh, had kind of fallen into obscurity until um, Pope Benedict's uh, Regensburg Address. <laughs> Um, and uh, to which <laughs> all of a sudden he rocketed into fame again. Um, he, up until that point, uh, he was mostly known to uh, scholars of the obscure like myself. Um, and, uh, but Pope St. Benedict, Pope St. Ben, uh, Pope Benedict um, XVI used him as an example of this ongoing discussion that had happened in the Middle Ages about the importance of rationality in faith. And he took out um, a, uh, a, a short quote that appeared in his address. But I want to point out again exactly um, how in some ways it characterizes and also needs to be taken within a particular context of this other side of those who, whose experience with Islam had not been positive and who were uh, quite convinced that uh, Muslims did not believe the same thing that Christians said. So um, Pope, uh, I'm sorry, Emmanuel, um, uh, Emperor Emmanuel uh, had said this in this dialogue with an educated Persian. We're not exactly sure who the educated Persian is, and this may even just be a hypothetical uh, dialogue. But he wrote in this letter, he said, just show me what Muhammad has brought that is new, and there you will find things only evil and inhumane, as his command to spread by the sword the faith that he preached. Now, one thing we have to think about um, is that this is written, 1391, uh, less than 40 years after the fall of Constantinople. I already mentioned that the Melkite Church, the Chalcedonian Church, um, which is the closest to the Latin Church, uh, had been in a constant battle with uh, Muslim invasions until uh, 1453. I'm, I'm sorry, this happened before then. Uh, until 1453 when Constantinople actually falls. Um, but in the, at the end of the 14th century, we see that there is a lot of hostility between Muslims and Christians because um, for the Byzantines, their primary experience of Muslims had been in uh, these Islamic invasions and, and armies. So again, we have this kind of, um, in some ways, apocalyptic but extremely negative um, perception uh, very unconcerned about what Muslims themselves actually believe or whether there's compatibility, but much more an emphasis on their experience of these invading armies. 
we're going to jump forward quite a bit then to um, to Vatican II. There's an awful lot that happens in between there, and, but I've only been given 45 minutes, so I'm going to have to skip over that. Um, if you talk to me afterwards, and I'll tell you all about it. But um, but we see that in general, um, especially the Western Church. Uh, got most of its information about Islam first from uh, from the Crusades and the experience of fighting against Muslims uh, in the uh, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century, um, but also then the experience of Spain. And Spain, uh, contrary to popular belief, was a little more mixed than we sometimes uh, present it. Uh, in some ways, Spain was a, a, a shining example of Muslims, Christians, and Jews living together. Um, but it also, as we can see from the Reconquista, there also was a lot of unhappiness on the part of people, um, especially Christians, who felt that they had been invaded. And um, eventually, as we all know, um, from the north they begin moving further and further until they uh, finally push Muslims back out into North Africa. And so we get in Spain both positive and negative. We get very positive um, experiences of the common translation movement, um, the uh, knowledge that comes through um, uh, through Spain is uh, translations from the Greek into Arabic and then from Arabic into Latin, um, which brings you know the Greek philosophers back into Italy and, uh, and um, Spain and France, and ultimately leads to the Renaissance. Um, on the other hand, there is very much a feeling of, be, of being conquered people and living under a foreign rule. Even three, four hundred years later, there are still those who speak of themselves as, being, as living under a foreign rule. So we get, again, both of these. Um, and we see that playing out in different ways. Uh, there's a lot to say about the period of colonization, et cetera. But by the time we get to the 20th century, after the Second World War, uh, we all know that there's a real um, desire to come up with a more explicit statement of how Catholics ought to think about and speak about members of other religions. Um, I'm going to give you two, three examples, uh, two from, um, uh, from the Second Vatican Council and one from an encyclical that uh, really today for people working in Muslim-Christian relations form the basis for how we ought to think about this question of do Muslims and Christians believe in the same God. The first one, Lumen Gentium, uh, paragraph 16 says this, the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the creator. Okay, and again, we've already seen that that was one of the first things that, uh, that Christians acknowledged and recognized about, um, about Muslims. In the first place amongst these are the Muslims, who professing to hold the faith of Abraham along with us adore the one and merciful God who on the last J will judge mankind. So here we see um, a reiteration of this idea that uh, Muslims and Christians both recognize a God who is the creator uh, and who will bring creation to an end, all right? as opposed to a cyclical worldview like um, as we might find in Buddhism. Um, paragraph 17, uh, through her work, uh, the, the work of the church, whatever, is, whatever good is in the minds and hearts of men, Whatever good lies latent in the religious practices and cultures of diverse peoples is not only saved from destruction, but is also cleansed, raised up, and perfected into the glory of God, the confusion of the devil, and the happiness of man. So another question that has arisen and is hotly debated by theologians in their spare time is what, um, whether, how we ought to think about uh, do religions actually lead people to, um, uh, to God or are people led to God in spite of their religions? Right? Uh, the Second Vatican Council seems to say pretty clearly that religious practices themselves can actually lead one to God, such as prayer five times a day. That whenever one stops to remember and to praise God, that that practice um, as uh, Islamic prayer, uh, that that is in fact leading one to the one God. Okay. A second one, this uh, encyclical uh, we have in 1964 of Paul VI um, says this, when we have those worshipers who adhere to other monotheistic systems, and here, of course, are thinking primarily, especially the Muslim religion, uh, 
We do well to admire these people for all that is good and true in their worship of God. All right. So particularly, and again, they're especially thinking um, of the two practices that um, Christians and Muslims have always recognized as having in common, of prayer, constant prayer, and of um, charitable acts. Um, one could also ask, add to that fasting. Um, there are lots of other ones, but um, those are the two that always come to the fore. The last one, Nostra Aetate, which is the uh, church's more specific teaching um, on uh, other religions. Paragraph three speaks particularly about Islam. And it really is probably the first time that we have a very clear statement made by, uh, an official statement made by the Catholic Church specifically uh, addressing uh, Muslim beliefs. It was intended um, to both identify those things that Christians could, Catholics could acknowledge, and in a strange sort of a way um, to leave aside those things that were more controversial. And one will notice that those th two things would be Muhammad and the Quran. Um, it says this, the church regards with esteem also the Muslims. They adore one God, here we have that phrase again, living and subsisting in himself merciful and all-powerful, the creator of heaven and earth, who has spoken to men. They take pains to submit wholeheartedly, even to his inscrutable decrees, just as Abraham, with whom the faith of Islam takes pleasure in linking itself, submitted to God. Though they do not acknowledge Jesus as God, they revere him as a prophet. They also honor Mary, his virgin mother. At times, they even call on her with devotion. In addition, they await the day of judgment when God will render their deserts to all those who have been raised up from the dead. And finally, they value the moral life and worship God, especially through prayer, fasting, I'm sorry, prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. So here we have a pretty explicit list of things that we can identify as um, things that are valued by both communities. It doesn't say a lot of things, though. Um, does not speak about Muhammad, does not speak about the Quran, does not really speak about the way of revelation, um, does not mention uh, the question of original sin, of grace, etc. Today, I, I suspect that the, um, the fathers of the council would be a little surprised at how, how many different people read this document, though. Although it was intended to be widely disseminated, it's very much intended uh, for Catholics, and especially for clergy, um, as the basis for their own thinking and teaching on it. And so even though 50 years later we can look at it and say, well, they didn't say this, or they didn't address that, or they didn't talk about this, um, I think what they were trying to do, and they've done very well, is to lay the basis for an ongoing conversation that we can have trying to address some of these other problems. It probably is getting to be about time for us to have another, um, some kind of a, a synod or, or a more official statement on this. So, with those texts in mind, um, I want to talk um, more specifically about some theological issues in the next 15, 20 minutes. I think we can say, and this, uh, this is going to be my conclusion, um, to the question of do Muslims and Christians worship the same God, the answer is yes and no. And um, depending on the, t the way that we're asking that question, all right, it's extremely complex uh, because we can say that there are two, maybe two sides of the same coin, um, which is this problem that has perplexed people from the very beginning. It's not just that we're, we can't figure it out ourselves. People have been trying to figure this out for a long time. On the one hand, it's obvious that Muslims and Christians worship the one God who is creator of everything. Muslims claim to worship this God. It's an aspect of every part of the prayers. It's the basis for the entire understanding of faith, of submission to God, of um, the purpose of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, that what God intends for human beings to do is all done in service of creation. All right? Uh, just as we see in the, uh, the opening of Genesis, uh, the man and woman are given the task of being kind of the overseers of creation. 
Okay? They're the gardeners, so to speak. Um, they are caretakers of creation and so are put in a special position above the animals, below the angels, but actually in a very privileged position. They are friends of God. Okay? They're, um, we would, uh, Muslims wouldn't use this word, but are children of God. They're God's, they're God's caretakers. Right? Um, and the Catholic Church uh, also, um, throughout, uh, I've done uh, m most of my academic work has been on the uh, 8th, 9th, and 10th century uh, Christian writings uh, in uh, engagement, uh, theological engagement with, uh, with Muslims. And one thing that we see in almost all of these texts is a recognition that Muslims desire to worship God authentically. That um, Muslims are not being duplicitous, are not uh, worshiping Satan or something like that. Um, this was not an idea that appears early in the encounters with Islam. But rather, the question really comes up of how does one know if one is worshiping God authentically? How do we know if our revelation is true? And um, those of you who know anything about the, um, the patristic period, we find lots of texts that are titled, you know, On the True Religion. And this genre also spills over into Muslim Christian debates. Um, how do we know if we're worshiping God in the correct way? And how do we know if our revelation is true? And so they come up with lots of different ways. For example, how do you know if a prophet is a true prophet or a false prophet? Um, how do you know if your clergy are, um, are, are good clergy and authentic clergy? Many of you are probably aware of the Donatist controversy. You know, does a, um, does a, a, a priest have to be um, ritually pure? Uh, if a priest commits a serious sin, does that invalidate the sacraments? All right? And so this question of how do we know if our religion is true um, become, it kind of comes to the, the center of this debate. Um, uh, it's, as I said, um, almost every major writer uh, from that period uh, at some point addresses that question. What is the, tr how does one know the true religion? Because the second thing, uh, the second side of it is, if um, I have a very different understanding of who God is, am I really worshiping the same God? If I believe, for example, that God does not enter into the material world or cannot enter into the material world, um, then is that the same God as a God who can enter into the material world, enter into creation? How much do we have to share in order to say that we both believe in the same God? How much is enough? How much is too little? At what point is it heresy? At what point is it a completely different religion? At what point is it a completely different God? Now I mentioned already uh, St. John of Damascus who um, uh, died around the year uh, 450, which was actually a real turning point in Islamic history. It's the very end of the Umayyad dynasty and the beginning of the Abbasid dynasty, which is significant in that um, the Abbasid dynasty begins a, a program of um, maybe Arabization and to a certain extent Islamization. Um, the Abbasid uh, um, Caliphate has a much clearer sense of what it would be to create a, um, an Islamic society, putting in place um, uh, Islamic law much more. Um, that is the moment in which Arabic becomes the official language. Up until that point, people mostly spoke their local languages. Now um, all official documents, for example, are done in Arabic, et cetera. And so there's quite a few changes. And he dies right, um, right when the Abbasids come into power. He himself lived among, among Muslims. His father uh, worked um, for the caliph. Uh, he was, uh, John of Damascus himself, was a tutor for the caliph's son. And so he knew Islam quite well. And he uh, was convinced that Muslims and Christians had a lot in common, but they didn't have everything in common. He is the, really the first one that really explicitly <coughs> says Islam ought to be regarded as a heresy. It has a lot of things in common with Christianity, but it is not Christianity. It's outside of the ecclesia, right? 
Um, heresy was, at that time, not really the same way we tend to think of it in the post-Reformation age. At that time, it was a way of really giving more of a, what we might call a genealogy, kind of tracing, you know, where did an error come from? Right? Where, did, um, where, did, where did people make the mistake? Right? Where did it go wrong? And it's also a way of giving an account of history. And so John includes Islam at the very end of his long list of heresies as a way of talking about the history of the, of the church and the different ways um, and practices that have been rejected and accepted um, throughout that history. He didn't really ever call into question monotheism. Um, he points out some erroneous ideas of Muhammad. He doesn't really question um, many of the practices such as prayer, fasting, almsgiving, etc. He seems to think that those things make um, uh, uh, um, Islam and Christianity have a lot of commonality. But what he did say was that um, one of the ways in which we can think about the differences between Muslims and Christians is that um, Christians have a particular concept of salvation history. That we begin, uh, Christians begin with the idea that all human beings are born with original sin. They all have, we all have that propensity uh, to turn away from God and to um, do it our way, as my son used to say when he was little, um, I want to do what I want to do, okay? Um, I want to do what I want to do, and, um, and I don't want to do what anybody else, and particularly not God, is telling me what to do, right? And as a consequence, um, Christians uh, speak um, this idea that we need God's help, God's grace, and that this renewal of the relationship between Christianity, I mean, sorry, between creation and God, comes through the incarnation, that in the incarnation that God puts right um, this broken relationship that has come about because of our unwillingness to, um, to follow God's law and God's will. Right? Of course, it's quite complicated, um, but that's my short version of this. Um, what, um, what, what John says is that Muslims have a tremendous confidence Okay, um, in the ability of human beings to fulfill God's requirements. Okay, um, and the Quran actually is pretty explicit about this: that uh, what God gives human beings requirements that can be fulfilled, that one can submit to God, and one can do what God requires, and that puts one in a right relationship with God. There's no necessity for an incarnation. There's no necessity for grace. There's no um, sense of this, um, uh, the necessity for God to actually enter into creation and to be present, for instance, in the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's a very different concept. So this actually then changes, um, in some ways, uh, an entire you know, perception of what is going on in the religion. How, who is this God? Is this God a God who enters into creation, who draws creation back into, um, uh, into this uh, reconciled and forgiven relationship? Or does God give us what is the, the rules and the revelation that is required so that we know how to submit and to praise God in an appropriate way? Now, ultimately, we can say, well, in some ways, uh, the conclusion might be the same, right? That human beings ought to love one another, uh, give uh, prayer and praise and fasting and almsgiving and, um, uh, and take care of um, each other and put God at the center. On the other hand, um, it really does make a difference of whether one starts with original sin or not. Okay? And so this, in many ways, um, has, uh, has been at the center of the debate. I want to mention um, someone who I, um, I think has given us a little bit um, uh, of um, help in thinking about this is a man named Cardinal de Luogo, uh, who I uh, include because he was closely uh, related to the Dominicans, uh, who died in the 17th century. And he was very insistent that we ought to take seriously that Muslims do have faith in God because they have faith in the God of Abraham precisely because their sacred texts, he says, are reliant on the Old and New Testament, 
And so one cannot say then that Muslims do not believe in the same God as Christians because they recognize uh, Abraham and um, would in fact say that Abraham is at the absolute center. I think that it's, um, it's not super helpful for us to go down the route of trying to determine did the Quran come from someplace? Did it come from, um, as many uh, early Muslim Christians said, perhaps from the Nestorians? Is it dependent on the New Testament or the Old Testament or not? But rather, um, we probably, I think, would um, uh, do better to turn back to this idea of Christians and Muslims um, intend to worship and praise the one God who is the creator. Now, does this mean that we do believe the same? And I would say again, yes and no, all right? Yes, in an important way. Yes, in the way that brings us to a constant um, search for what is true, that we ought to work together to try to discover this and to, um, uh, in the process, for instance, of dialogue, in presenting our, um, our own faith, uh, answering the questions that are being asked um, by our dialogue partners. Oftentimes, uh, we're really forced to explain things that we might not otherwise have to explain. Um, and that that helps us then to come closer and closer to understanding the proper way to, to worship God. On the other hand, I think we need to be very careful about not giving away the store when we're in dialogue. And I know that that's something that a lot of people are quite worried about. Um, there are some very profound differences. I myself um, uh, really am convinced that um, original sin makes all the difference. <laughs> um, the more I think about it, and the longer I work in this field, I used to, uh, um, I often heard when I first began in interreligious dialogue, um, people would say, well, the difference between Muslims and Christians is they don't believe in original sin and Catholics or Christians do. Um, as if that's just kind of a, you know, um, <laughs> kind of an aside, you know, it's not really that important. But in fact, the more that I've, I've um, been involved in it, the more that I've realized that that has just tremendous implications for all kinds of things of how we regard um, society and law and the order of society, um, meaning and purpose of the Christian community, uh, et cetera, how we, act, how we think about forgiveness. Um, all of these things are very much tied to the way Christians perceive um, the role of original sin, and especially then the necessity of the incarnation. Um, so just saying, you know, that, um, well, you know, they don't, they don't have this and we have that, and, you know, that's, that's uh, all there is to talk about it, um, means that I think that we have um, a lot to explore and perhaps um, maybe should uh, give us pause in thinking that we can make quick and easy distinctions and decisions about what we do and do not have in common. The more that I study Islam, the more that I find that uh, I, I don't know, uh, I don't have all the answers about Christianity. And it really is true that the longer I've been involved in dialogue that I see um, that Studying other religions challenges us to think about our own faith in very important and significant ways. I want to, um, at the very end here, uh, to give a quote, which I think um, it's a little long, but it's really worth reading the whole thing. Um, this was a very important address that John Paul II um, gave in Nigeria in 1982. He was very interested in um, improving relations with Muslims, took very seriously uh, the need for interreligious dialogue, and was very active in, in promoting and um, supporting interreligious dialogue with Islam and with Muslims all over the world. And I think um, of all of these of uh, the, the speeches and talks that he's given, I think this one probably summarizes best uh, what I think that we ought to um, reflect on. He says this. Um, we both believe in one God who is the creator of man. We acclaim God's sovereignty. We defend man's dignity as God's servant. We adore God and profess total submission to him, and thus, in a true sense, we can call one another brothers and sisters in faith in the one God. 
And we are grateful for this faith, since without God, the life of man would be like the heavens without the sun. Because of this faith that we have in God, Christianity and Islam have many things in common. The privilege of prayer, the duty of justice, com accompanied by compassion and almsgiving, and above all, a sacred respect for the dignity of man, which is the foundation of the basic rights of every human being, including the right to life of the unborn child. We Christians have received from Jesus, our Lord and Master, the fundamental law of love of God and love of neighbor. I know that this law of love has a profound echo in your hearts too, speaking to Muslims. For in your sacred book, together with the invitation to faith, you are exhorted to excel in good works as well. In Surah 5. And so, I guess in conclusion, uh, and then we can open it up for some questions, I would say that um, we can say that we do believe in, um, in one God who is creator. We adore and worship that one God. And although we don't agree on many aspects of this belief and worship, as Christians, um, we must hold, I think, that God desires the salvation. God desires the salvation of all people. And that the Holy Spirit, Spirit is at work in mysterious ways in the lives of every person. And so our call then really is to continue this work of faith, seeking understanding, following um, uh, Anselm, and uh, to do this with love and charity. So, thank you. We have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Um, that's not a heck of a lot of time, so I ask that um, you make your question concise so more people can actually be involved if they so choose. Oh, there's one. You're welcome. I believe that um, Muslims believe that Muhammad received Mm -hmm. An inspiration which he, he wrote down that, that the Quran was dictated to him. Yes. And it's almost as if it was done in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. But my understanding of the history of the area is that Muhammad would have had a lot of contact with Jewish people, and Christians, like there was a big trading mm -hmm. area there. there. It always strikes me that there's there are a lot of similarities. Like I, there's something in the Quran about forgiving 70 times 70, right. the same as Jesus. <clears throat> uh, so the one is was a woman that I had this conversation with. She almost said, "Like, are you accusing Muhammad of pl plagiarizing?" And I know <laughs> but it's like you believe in the one God. That God, that message of morality, if it's insp inspired into Moses, Jesus, and Mm -hmm. and Muhammad uh, you would come up with those same basic rules about almsgiving and charity, works of charity and all that. What do, you, do, you, do you see, like, did Muhammad think that he was starting a new religion or was he just on a continuum? Along yes, the same line? okay, um, actually that's an excellent question. Uh, and uh, they only gave me 45 minutes, so, <laughs> so now it's my chance to answer that question. Um, so I would say from a Christian perspective, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things to say about this. Um, first of all, it is, it is true. I mean, we know that it's true that Muhammad lived in an environment which it would have been impossible for him not to have come in contact with Christians and Jews. Just being a, a caravan trader going to Damascus, which was a Christian city, um, he would have had to have come into contact with Christians and Jews. Um, and also the area is much smaller than we sometimes think. There was a lot of interaction. Um, but Muhammad seems to have understood that his vocation, his calling, was um, to, to bring a message in, con in continuity with these other people who had also spoken to God, or not, well, had heard from God, we'll say, well, had heard from God in some way. They're usually, um, uh, spoken of as either messengers or prophets, and there's a distinction there, but generally the understanding in the Quran is that they have received some kind of a message. Um, the Quran says that it comes both to confirm and then in a certain way to correct the message that came before. So did Muhammad think that what he was doing was bringing a new message? 
The answer to that would be no, absolutely not. Um, what Muhammad thought, I think that I think that he thought that he was doing was bringing this message of monotheism. First, he thought he was bringing it to the polytheists, and you can see this pretty clearly in the Quran that there are many places where the polytheists are addressed. Um, he understands that that he's got the message, or he's got some of the message of other monotheists already. But then as time goes on, there seems to be a growing tension with other monotheists. And that's where we see as Jews and Christians reject the message or reject him as a prophet, then there is more and more tension. And then we get a kind of this idea that the Quran has come to um, not necessarily replace, but to correct those things in the other scriptures that are not correct. Now, for Christians, what's important about that is that the Quran is pretty explicit about rejecting the Incarnation and the Trinity, which, of course, are the two central teachings of Christianity. So that's where we get someone like John of Damascus who says, well, obviously, their Muslims are more like the Jews. They, don't, they also don't accept the, um, the uh, Incarnation and the Trinity. So now, a second question, which is where I thought you were going to go with this, was, is so what can, how should Christians regard the Quran? I think um, the church fathers said that we can find what we might call seeds of the word, places in these texts, these non-Christian texts, these non-Jewish texts that, um, that lead one to find God, right? They can lead one to find God. Does that mean that the religion itself is another instrument? I think that um, the Catholic Church has come down pretty clearly to say that no, that's not the case, but that the Quran can give us some insights. So Muslims, for instance, uh, can be led to worship of one God. Um, a, a kind of a delicate question that Christians have always had to think about is, did, should we think of that as revelation? Um, I think it's probably maybe better to think of it as a um, more like a mystical experience. You know, the way that we uh, we I, we identify people having these experiences in which they what they come with or what they present is not um, it's not understood as scripture, but still might have insights and um, might be useful for helping us understand aspects. of it. So, I mean, that's a little bit of a fudgy way of speaking about it, because it's a very delicate question. Um, Muslims would say, absolutely, it's God's revelation, and uh, it actually should perhaps replace the scriptures. Um, Mus Muslims usually do not read the, the Bible because of that, and don't feel the need to read the Bible. But Christians should, I think, say that you know, it's not, as some people have said, from Satan, for example. I mean, that's never been a Catholic position, and I think that's something that we ought to stand very hard against. Um, it's not a distorted message. Um, and uh, it, it's not, it, I mean, it is a critique of Christianity, but it's not, um, it's not the opposite of Christianity. So. Hi. In, in 2009, the Wall Street Journal did an editorial called Pope Provocateur okay. <laughs> about the writings of the Bible. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the phrase they highlighted is, in Islam, God is not bound even by his own word. Yes. And in other words, Islam's God is not amenable to reason, only will. And a lot, I thought that's what it meant. And a lot mm -hmm. of Islamic scholars that were really smart ran to the Pope saying, we believe in reason, which I yes, thought okay. was really smart. But <laughs> yeah. they also said he, he never apologized for the disturbance of the address. Well. But I guess my question mm -hmm. has to do with will. If he's mm -hmm. not bound by his own word and he's willed, is that because does that tie in with your them not believing in original sin, which makes you have to have reasons and and a and, and a solid something 
So yes, you, you've, okay, so you've just opened a huge can of worms, which I'll start, I'll, I'll do my best to address in three minutes or less, okay. Um, so, um, the, the, first of all, I'll just say something about the Regensburg Address. Um, uh, Pope Benedict, um, he didn't really apologize for what he said, because a lot of what he, I mean, mostly what his, um, his statement was about really didn't have anything to do with Islam. And it was really a, a that was kind of a, a sidetrack to it. Um, and as I said, one of the reasons why I used that quote was because it was it was really taken out of context. He knew what it was about. The people who he was talking to knew what it was about, which was that it was part of this dialogue challenging uh, Muslims to to explain themselves, which then the they did right. I mean, this is a part of a back and forth between them, and, and only one side of it got out. So that was that was quite unfortunate. That was Pope Benedict being an academic and not realizing. Um, that the internet existed. So I think uh, <laughs> that it could be tweeted seconds afterwards. Um, okay, but the real question he was pointing to is an actually uh, an old um, medieval problem, all right? Um, and that is, um, if you, is God really God if God is limited by rules, let's say, of reason, okay? Is God bound by mathematics, for example? There's a way in which um, if God is bound by mathematics, well then mathematics are God, right? Um, at the same time, um, human beings, and this is kind of the side that Thomas Aquinas comes down on, is to say that there's something about the order of creation and, um, and what we, you know, our, our rationality which plugs into this order of creation uh, that is true about God. And that allows us to have confidence and to be able to trust in God. So that when God says that God forgives, it's not that God says he forgives today and tomorrow he's not going to, right? That God is somehow bound by God's, um, uh, God's words. Now, I think what the New York Times article did not quite get, I'm sorry, Wall Street Journal, okay, the Wall Street Journal article uh, did not get right, is that it, Muslims certainly believe that what God says, for example, God gives the Quran, that's God's promise that these are the rules by which someone is going to be judged. Because, again, human beings can't live with that kind of uncertainty. Will God, God change the rules on us? And so the Quran then, is understood to be a copy of kind of God's promise, like God's contract with us, that these are the rules, and if we follow these rules, we will be in a right relationship with God. We'll be, we, we can be righteous, we can be in a right relationship with God. But Muslims and Muslim philosophers especially were always really, really nervous about saying that God is somehow bound, that God, because God has to be free, okay, God has to be free to be whatever God is, and even that our rationality only has very little access to who God is. Um, many of the, um, the writers, Ibn Hanbal, for example, he says, um, God is merciful, but not in any kind of way that we know, we know of mercy. Uh, Ibn Hanbal, he was a, a Muslim writer in the uh, ninth century. He says, um, uh, or, or one of them, a very famous um, Arabic phrase in the Middle Ages is Billa Kefa. We believe this without knowing how. Okay, Billa Kefa, without knowing how. Um, and so we have to have confidence. So, so faith really becomes confidence that God's not going to pull the rug out from us. Right? Um, now, the Catholic um, philosophers and theologians like Aquinas went much more down the road of saying that we can be pretty confident based on the order of the universe, basically natural law, because of our reason to plug into what, uh, what is right and wrong, that God reveals, for instance, in nature, and that that can get us to a certain understanding of God. The other side is to say, you know, actually nature doesn't really tell us anything about God. For all we know, I always use the example in my class of um, a fish in a fishbowl. The fish in the fishbowl uh, looks around and sees everything outside of the fishbowl and imagines that it can kind of figure out what the world is like outside the fishbowl. But actually, the, the fish in the fishbowl sitting on the kitchen counter has no idea what's outside. 
Okay, what's outside in the in the greater world it doesn't have any concept of space or you know the moon or anything like that. And so we need to be we need to be aware that as human beings, our access to knowledge about God is really limited. There's a way in which Muslims and Christians actually are in a kind of a roundabout way very similar on that, um, but Catholics especially have quite a bit of confidence that we can kind of know something about God based on the order of the universe. So, and Muslims were a lot less confident about that. Mm -hmm. So that's where that article, I think, it, it made it a little too simplistic. Mm -hmm. um, what, um, what I think Pope Benedict wanted was for people to um, get back to a more Thomistic, perhaps, way of thinking about religion. Um, I think we've kind of fallen into a, you know, religion is believing things that are unbelievable. And, um, and I think what he wants us to do is to, to get more to see religion and science are not incompatible, for example. Um, he was calling for a lot more rationality uh, and, and thinking again more in a medieval sense. So I think it totally backfired on him. Totally backfired on him. So, okay, that was, a, that was more than three minutes. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, my question sort of goes off from her. I was looking at the phrase total submission to him. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is that at least Catholics and Muslims don't mean the same thing. No, no, no. So, you, you know, you use those words, yes. but you got to be very careful. Exactly. And, and in that context, um, the, the appropriation of philosophy, and especially Aristotle by mm -hmm. Catholics, and the rejection, especially in Al-Ghazali's mm -hmm. form, yes. where, where Al Ghazali talks about the incoherence of philosophy. Yes. And so, so can you sort of reflect a little bit on that? And I know that's a huge topic, but right. Yeah. Uh, all the questions. No, all the questions tonight have been a whole, uh, a whole uh, course actually. Um, I think in the. Uh, I, I mean, I would say that um, you pointed to a really good example here. That one of the real profound differences in the way Muslims and Christians think about their relationship with God is that. For, for Muslims, submission to God is very much like, um, like the submission of a servant, okay, um, to a master. All right, um, the servant is given a lot of privileges. Um, they are God's representative on earth. They care for creation, etc. But there is a there is a, a profound difference and an even separation in the, their way of being. Christians, on the other hand, um, put a great deal of emphasis on being God's children, okay? That God treats human beings as his children, um, and that that happens, we're, we're children through adoption, uh, through, and through the incarnation, right? That God can enter into creation and become human and that that is what puts us in a relationship with God. And so to submit to God's will, um, Christians tend to think more as, you know, as Christ submitted his will, that's the model for us to submit. For Muslim, it's, it's much more a recognition of God's omnipotence, God's absolute power, and again, that God can choose not to follow his rules. All right, but he, but but out of mercy, he does. So um, I always tell my students be very careful um, when uh, I don't hear it so much anymore. But that all religion is about love, um, because it depends on what you mean by love. I mean, God loves creation in Islam in the in the sense that God cares for creation. Um, Christians tend to think more on the in terms of like parental love. Um, so that's just, that's just one example of that. Um, I mean, there are lots of different examples. Um, let's see, how would it, um, I mean, forgiveness. Um, I think even one thing I'm working on right now is, uh, is looking at the way the covenant, the term covenant is used, um, which is so important. The new covenant is so important in Christianity. The, the term covenant appears all over in the Quran, but it's much, it has much more of a, uh, a sense of a contract that is tied to receiving a book, tied to receiving a message. 
Whereas in Judaism and and then later in Christianity, the example of covenant is like the marriage covenant, um, and especially the way Catholics think about the, the the relationship between the church and Christ. You know, the church is the bride of Christ. The idea of the covenant there. It's just a it's a different way of thinking about it, and I think that also has some serious implications. So. I don't know if that answered your question very well, but um, uh, th but uh, I mean that's actually a, a very good question. It's a, a huge topic. We have time for one more. One more. Let's go over here. Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Um, interesting what you said. There are many questions here, but you mentioned polytheism, and yes. at the time of Inception of Islam, there was still much polytheism. Mm -hmm. That's what I gather from you, yes. which, which is different. And also another thing that you said, you mentioned heresy is different. Perhaps we look at it today. You mentioned the ecumenical councils. In some ways, Christianity was still trying to sort itself out mm -hmm. to a degree. So, could you comment on those? Yes. Things? Yeah. So uh, one thing we know, uh, we don't know a whole lot about the Arabian Peninsula, in part because. Um, Saudi Arabia has really restricted any kind of archaeological work, so a lot of what we know about it really is from historical documents and stuff. But what seems to be the case is that on the west coast of Arabia, um, it was pretty settled, uh, and especially in the south, in Yemen, there were very um, uh, um, uh, active Christian community. Um, and also, we always have to remember that right across uh, the sea there, um, in Ethiopia, there was an, a Jewish kingdom, and there were all kinds, lots of Christians living there. So it, Mecca was really surrounded by Jews and Christians. However, it's also quite clear that in the central part of Arabia, um, there were many, many um, polytheistic tribes. And at the beginning of Muhammad's career, um, there's a lot of emphasis in his, the, the accounts of his life and kind of what we can piece together from the Quran, that he understood himself as bringing this message, which had already been received by the Jews and the Christians and this other group called the Sabians, and now he was bringing this to the Arabic-speaking people. So the Quran says this is an Arabic reading of the revelation. The word Quran means kind of a, a reading or a recitation of something. So we can think that, you know, perhaps he was thinking, well, the Jews had it in Hebrew and the Christians had it in Aramaic and in Alharic and all these other languages, Greek. Um, of course, the Arabs should have it in Arabic, right? And so at the first movement of that message seems to be his bringing this um, monotheistic message to the, the polytheists. Now, the trick, the problem comes though later in his career when it, he's not really accepted by Jews and Christians. He says some of them accept him, but not everybody does. And that's when we begin to see then this more, the developing consciousness of a kind of a, a different religious movement, okay? Um, he doesn't come and start out and say, oh, I'm starting a new religion because we need a new religion. Um, he starts out with this idea that what he's doing is bringing the same message to this group of people and that over time that they kind of split and go their own ways. So um, the other aspect that you said about the ecumenical councils, I think one of the biggest problems that we have um, in the United States and Europe in thinking about Islam is that we don't realize that Muslims and Christians lived side by side in the Middle East from the very beginning. Uh, we tend to, um, to think about Islam through the lens of the later European uh, thought about it, and many Europeans had a very limited uh, and often erroneous understanding of what was going on uh, in the Middle East and Muslims. Their experience really first was primarily through the Crusades. Uh, they didn't speak the language, they didn't understand what was going on. Um, whereas the Christians of the Middle East were you know, they had been with Muslims from the very beginning and had this long history of engagement, um, but they themselves were still kind of working out practices, and uh, and we still see that even today. So, um, yeah, it's a, I, I always say when, when uh, my students that the one thing I want them to end the class with is to, to realize that the European experience of Islam was very different from the Middle Eastern Christian experience of Islam. And also, let's carry a point further, in, and I don't know here, where it spreads through the Middle East, uh, you said sometimes Christians and Muslims live 
relatively peacefully and mm -hmm. the ethnics and politics that comes yeah. into religion exactly. that's part of the stew. Exactly. The ethnic area and uh, religion. And just like I mean just like in Europe you have um, you know you have Christian kings who acted uh, in a very unchristian way uh, and conquered places that had no, in ways that had nothing to do with religion and you had other Christian kings who conquered places uh, intending to bring Christianity. You have the same thing with Islam. Some caliphs, some governors, they had no interest really in spreading Islam. Others had uh, explicitly um, Islamic programs of to, you know, to make society more Islamic. So, you know, it really depends on where you were and at what time you're talking about. You can't make blanket judgments about the whole thing. Uh, that's, that's, note, a good way to that's a good way to end. <laughs> that's a good Thank way to end. you very much. Thank you.